Charles Leclerc wins the Bahrain Grand Prix. And Charles Leclerc wins the Australian Grand Prix. You've done it. At the beginning of the 2022 season, Ferrari looked like they were back where they belong, at the top. With one of the strongest driver pairings on the grid and finally a car that can compete for race wins, they almost seemed unstoppable. However, 18 races in, we're looking at a completely different picture. After starting the season with what pundits have said is the fastest car on the grid, how did Ferrari end up here? The Scuderia's year started with maximum points from Bahrain, and a surprise third and fourth place lucked into by Mercedes, with Red Bull starting the year with a double DNF. This was not to be representative of the year to come. Back to the top step of the podium for Max Verstappen, who wins the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Max Verstappen wins the French Grand Prix! Max Verstappen has taken the chequered flag to win the Japanese Grand Prix! Max Verstappen clinched the World Championship at Suzuka with four races remaining, bringing home 12 victories for Red Bull and another two wins coming from Sergio Perez. Checo has delivered a credible 41% of Red Bull points so far this season, a figure that we will focus on later. They promptly resolved their apparent reliability issues troubling them at the start of the season, looking certain to take the Constructors' title back home to Milton Keynes as well with an impressive 145-point lead. Ferrari, however, continue to display their ability to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory epitomizing pretty much how the entire season has gone for the Scuderia. Having not won a Drivers' Championship since 2007 with Kimi Raikkonen, Ferrari have failed to capitalize on having multiple championship-winning drivers in their cars ever since. But why? Such disappointments are emblematic of systemic failure. Could a personnel failure exist? Could Ferrari fall prey to believing too much in its own culture, in its own brand? That brings us to Sergio Marchioni. Originally, he was made CEO of Fiat in 2004. Ten years later, he became the chairman of Ferrari. The wolf of Maranello wasted no time in making big changes. Marchione, known for his unconventional management style, completely revamped Ferrari's management structure so he could grease the F1 team's decision-making process. One really high-profile casualty of that initial firing spree was chairman Luca Montezemolo. With him went Fernando Alonso's excuse for non-performance. Off he went. Team principal Marco Mariachi, the last Montezemolo hire, didn't survive 2014 professionally. He was gone by November, seven months after he got the job. Firmly against top-heavy management, Marciani looked for a new breed of technical director. He wanted someone who wasn't jaded from his years of experience in the F1 circus. Fresh eyes was his solution to the Scuderia's endemic problems. What the new recruit had to have was discipline, leadership, and passion. Ascending as team director after the purge was Maurizio Arrivabene. Marcioni probably felt that the ship could be steadied by the former Philip Morris manager. Also coming to the F1 team at the time were two Ferrari employees, Ignacio Reda and Mattia Binotto. Reda, as an F1 strategist, came on board in 2014, and Binotto, as chief technical officer, arrived in 2016. Crucially, Benotto had been, at the time, a Ferrari employee for 21 years. Almost immediately, the sparks began to fly. Time after time, there were clashes between Arriva Bene and Benotto concerning direction, race strategy, and internal politics. Marizo was always going to be at a disadvantage with Benotto. While Arriva Bene had seniority in terms of age and position, Binotto knew the team like the back of his hand. Marcioni died suddenly in 2018. 
Arriva Bene leaves Ferrari at the end of that season. Like a victorious Rocky over Apollo Creed, Binotto takes the championship belt and assumes the coveted post of technical director. Meanwhile, Rueda is in a position where even race wins were being questioned and technically torn apart by pundits. Also, victories were coming further and further apart. There were times when a year had passed without a victory for the Tifosi. A lot of this is due to the overall direction of the team, but there have been some instances of moronic race strategy as well. Raikkonen leaves Ferrari at the end of 2018. In comes budding superstar Charles Leclerc for 2019. Ferrari had a four-time champion in one car and one who is arguably the world's most anticipated rookie in the other. Leclerc began to outperform Vettel. Seb left for Aston Martin and Carlos Sainz was confirmed for 2021. Youth with talent and experience occupies both cockpits. Ferrari is running out of excuses. There has always been a group of people at Ferrari F1 that are made men, in for life, protected. Benotto seems to be one of them. He earned his place through experience and has delivered. He is a mechanical engineer and has designed better power units during his years as CTO. This year's power unit too has Mr. Benotto's fingerprints all over it, seemingly having an Achilles heel. It can be argued that it's experiencing catastrophic detonation when high power engine maps are called for. Both drivers are on the back foot, even after negotiating the need to run four power units this year. Every other team this year has made do with three. By Austria, Leclerc was on his fourth unit and Sainz took his fourth PU after his car exploded spectacularly. With the engine freeze in full effect for 2022, Ferrari grid penalties will be standard fare for the rest of the season. Then there is this issue of the legality of the floor. Red Bull could be running two differently floored cars in recent races. This coincides with the sudden drop of form from Red Bull's second car. Red Bull has enough of a points cushion to run practice sessions during races. Ferrari doesn't have this luxury. Given the amount of data Mercedes had to generate to make progress, points to secure the championships might be a very, very scarce commodity for the rest of the season. What has Rueda done to deserve his tenure? Why is Bonotto saying to the press that nothing needs to change? Why is he always defending Rueda? The mental picture of old men sitting in smoke-filled rooms patting themselves on the back, looking for worlds to conquer, and congratulating themselves on past conquests may be stereotypical, but it fits here. Ferrari can keep the room, but it needs to get rid of a few chairs and open a window. Ferrari has, from the first time they turned a wheel in F1, been known for erratic decision-making in terms of race strategy, an aspect that plagues all Formula One teams from time to time, but what transpired in Monaco and Hungary this year proves they have that failing down to a science. Their drivers have been right just as many times as the strategist has, if not more. Out of the top three teams' driver pairings, Checo has brought in 41% of Red Bull's points earned, Sainz 46% for Ferrari, and Hamilton 45% for Mercedes. Statistically, Ferrari might have a more equally matched driver pairing, however, factoring in the near 200 points lost to reliability and strategy, that advantage is wasted. Ruida is the head of the strategy think tank. The buck stops with him. If the Bonotto Rueda axis remains and nothing changes, then the chances for the constructors and drivers' championships are exceedingly remote at best. It is almost a certainty that they will lose the second place they now hold to Mercedes. An F1 season is always highly unpredictable, but it seems like deja vu when it comes to Ferrari. Where do you think the Tifosi will finish this season? Can they recover in the second half of the season? Their main title competitors, Red Bull, seem to be a well-oiled machine these days, but it wasn't always that way. Click here to check out how Red Bull began racing in Formula One. And thank you for watching.